so much for coming. Um, now you will know what I'm always doing in the library. Before I get started, I would like to thank um, Mrs. Joyce Durant, Nathan Flowers, and Tammy Ivins at the library. They have just made it so easy to get materials, and I wouldn't be able to do this without them. And I, I'm happy to see the students here because I do archival research and there's so much work that needs to be done in this area. So I hope that you will be encouraged. Okay, Society Queens, the Negro Press and the Harlem Renaissance. How does a Harlem school teacher become internationally known during the 1920s? Well, it helps to have friends who are writers for the most popular Negro newspapers. Through their coverage of the minutia of Harold Jackman's life and the lives of other notable Harlemites, journalist Jerry Major, Bercy Bearden, and Edward Perry helped Negroes to see themselves as glamorous, worldly, industrious, and sometimes a little naughty. Harold Jackman, is the subject of my book, Unmasking the New Negro. And through his correspondence, he offers an intimate view of the Harlem Renaissance. Usually identified as poet Countee Cullen's best friend, Jackman actually was chosen by Elaine Locke to be the physical representative of the New Negro. He appeared so frequently in Ebony Magazine as a model that one reader remarked, my, what a distinguished looking gentleman. His, ad, his picture appears in an ad in almost every issue. In addition to being a professional model for most of his life, he was a co-founder of the Harlem Experimental Theater and the Negro Actors Guild. He actually appears in Breakfast at Tiffany's as an extra. There's not enough time to mention all of the organizations that he supported which reveal his commitment to the arts and to the children of Harlem. But I cannot overlook what is his greatest achievement, the founding of what is now known as the Countee Cullen Harold Jackman Memorial Collection. Jackman's work on the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection at Yale uh, led him to create an archive at a historically black university. Holdings of the collection include correspondence between, from Langston Hughes, Jesse Fawcett, Carl Van Becten, Eric Waldron, Dorothy West, Zora, who needs no last name, uh, Wallace Thurman, and Countee. There are also manuscripts by Langston Hughes and James Baldwin. Fittingly, Hughes saw Jackman's life as being representative of the opportunities available to the new Negro. He writes, it was a period when Harold Jackman, a handsome young Harlem school teacher of modest means, calmly announced one day that he was sailing for the Riviera for a fortnight to attend Princess Murat's yachting party. A frequent traveler to Europe, Harold met the princess in Paris during the infamous summer of 1928 and enticed her to visit New York City, specifically Harlem. Um, Jackman was also described by, by historian David Levering Lewis as lording his nobility by association all over Harlem and gradually acquiring a French accent. <laughs> These journalists and friends of Jackman's, most particularly Geraldine Major and Edward Perry, used their columns to celebrate, instruct, and admonish their readers slash friends. Little attention has been paid to the role of the Negro, to the Negro press and its role in the documentation of the social world of, in the Harlem Renaissance, yet its influence cannot be overlooked. Elaine Locke, a philosophy professor at Howard University and a man who's commonly known as the father of the Harlem Renaissance, praised Negro newspapers and magazines for helping to expand the consciousness of Harlemites. Some, like E. Franklin Frazier, saw the press coverage of social events as being the type of aspirational lifestyles that could inspire the Negro working class. He wrote, Negro newspapers are a good index of the extent to which middle class ideals have captured the imaginations 
of the Negro. The parties, the cars, the homes, and the jewelry of the elite find a place in all of these papers. There was a sense that the descriptions of the teas and the concerts, the get-togethers and the bon voyage parties and other social events involving Negroes in London and Paris um, were not represented what was possible for all Negroes and were not merely displays of wealth and privilege. In his first autobiography, The Big C, Langston Hughes states that the average Harlemite um, had no knowledge of the Harlem Renaissance and felt that if it was taking place, it hadn't raised their wages any. Yet, they were clearly intrigued by the social lives of their brethren. The extensive press coverage of the 1928 wedding between Yolanda Du Bois, the only surviving daughter of, renown of renowned scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, and poet County Cullen surpassed the coverage of any wedding before and after. It was seen as the social event of the Harlem Renaissance and um, a rebirth. People were very emotionally invested, so emotionally invested that 5,000 people showed up, uninvited. Publications such as the New York Amsterdam News, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Baltimore Afro-American, the Chicago Defender, and the little known but hilarious Interstate Tattler became vehicles for the promotion of New Negro Society through the coverage of news events and because of, of their gossip columns, society columns. Um, they were important tools in eradicating the image of the old Negro. The Negro press, particularly the society columns, perfected and maintained this image of the new Negro as middle class, well-educated, highly cultured, well-traveled, and civic-minded. Indeed, 50% of the press coverage of Howard Jackman involved his work on behalf of civic organizations. So while covering these news, the news of marriages, divorces, births, illnesses, um, professional and professional accomplishments, the gossip columnists established a social protocol for the new Negro. They provided readers with these social activities. Those who provided the readers with these social activities were, were exceptionally talented journalists whose work deserves greater recognition. Geraldine Disman, Bessie Bearden, and Edward Perry helped to burnish the image of the new Negro and set and maintain the highest standards for presenting Negro life. Sadly, Bearden and Perry have garnered little interest from scholars. Major has fared a bit better, perhaps due to her longevity of her career. My work is an attempt to secure permanent places for these journalists in the history of the Harlem Renaissance. Eugene Gordon's important 1927 essay on the history of the Negro press assess the various popular publications. While he stated, that the daily New York newspapers offered the best news coverage, Gordon describes the, Negro, the New York Amsterdam News as clearly the best local Negro newspaper in the country. That, of course, that's a dark tower with the poem on the wall. Um, the education and training of its staff, as well as the paper's layout and graphics, led Gordon to single out this publication for his highest praise. He also hailed the Harlem Weekly, the Interstate Tadler. I couldn't resist, I have a bunch of these. Um, he singled out the Interstate Tadler as being the best written, best edited, and best well known of the, of the smaller newspapers, and even labeled it a, the Colored Man Society Journal. While celebrated artists such as Nina Mae McKinney, Bert Williams, Paul Robeson, Jules Budso, Bill Bojangles Robinson, um, Nora Holt, and Ethel Waters often appeared in the society columns. It was the regular citizens of Harlem who were its stars. The columns centered on the lives of the married, the well-educated, the professional, and the artistic. Interestingly, there are very few mentions of the toll that the economic depression must have taken on the Harlem elite. Each spring and summer, they continued to travel abroad. 
Also, racism is rarely addressed, despite the overt and subtle um, forms of segregation that existed during the time. Um, Geraldine, Geraldine Hodges Disman Holland Major, Jerry, um, AKA Jerry Major, was the grand dame of Negro society and its leading gossip columnist. With her beauty and innate sense of style, she epitomized glamour. She also defined and defended the black elite. Born on July 29, 1894, she earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Chicago in 1915. Just think about that. She also earned graduate degrees at Chicago Teachers College, Columbia University, and New York University. In 1917, she married Binga Disman, and whom she uh, later divorced, but they moved from Chicago to New York, where her marriage ended and her career began. Binga became a powerful and well-known physician, and the Dismans lived on Strivers Row, where Jerry recalled life during the 1930s as being gay and wonderful, with luncheons, bridge parties, and formal white tie dances. Everybody seemed to have everything, cars, boats, summer homes. Her vibrant personality is clear in her book, Black Society. She openly acknowledged her first husband's nearly constant infidelity and about her second marriage to Gilbert Holland, a Canadian singer, Major wrote, and I quote, the marriage less, lasted less time than it takes to write about. She later married um, mortician John Major in Buenos Aires in 1947, and 46, and they were married until his death. Described as, quote, a jet setter before there were jets, Major was a well-known traveler. Um, Lawrence Otis Graham noted her influence on Negro society in his book, Our Kind of People, Inside America's Black Upper Class when he described her as the best known chronicler of black society from the 1920s to the 1970s. Actually, she wrote until 1984. Her last column and obituary appeared in the same issue of Jet. So like many new Negroes, Major was active politically. She was a member of the National Council of Negro Women, the NAACP, and a life member um, of the Negro Actors Guild. She was the New York Society editor, editor for the Pittsburgh Courier from 1924 to 1927. She left the Courier to become the managing editor of the Interstate Tadler, a position she held until 1932. One of her most significant achievements was hosting WABC's radio show, Negro Achievement Hour which introduced the public to Negro intellectuals, politicians, artists, and entertainers. She was also the women's editor for the New York Amsterdam News from 1948 to 1953. I wanted to give you an example of her work, so I'm gonna um, tell you about a very unusual event. An annual social event held during the Harlem Renaissance was the Hamilton Lodge Drag Ball. Geraldine Disman's column provides a much needed female voice to this event in which men impersonated women and women impersonated men. Actually, Jerry described them as being, as being women who outmen the men and men who outman men the women. Um, other articles about the ball ridicule the participants while assuring readers of the writer's manliness. Major's coverage um, was indicative of her respectful attitude towards difference. She does not dwell on the sexual orientation or the sexual lives of the ball's participants. Rather, she sees the ball, or she saw the ball, as being an agent of liberation. She made no reference to all the fights and um, assorted things that took place during the ball. Um, her column on the 1929 Hamilton Lodge Ball, which was always held around this time of the year. Um, it began with a celebration of individuality. She writes, 
the greatest joy of life is being able to express one's inner self. The second greatest joy is to mingle with one's kind. The third greatest joy is to receive the plaudits of one's fellows. Her tone was intimate and yet serious. She saw the ball as a place of safety, acceptance, and fellowship. And I should add, some people got really wrapped up in the ball and didn't want to take off their costumes. So they would walk down the street, just dressed as women, and then get arrested. <laughs> he grew his hair out for the ball. He needed to show it off. <laughs> this is what the guy said. It was his eighth arrest. Anyway, <laughs> rather, um, uh, let's see. Uh, she described the ball in great detail and captured the enthusiasm of the crowd. The participants were, in her words, gorgeous and exquisitely gowned. She focused on the, per on the performance of the participants and took care to list those by name with superior costumes. It, this was a place that mingled downtown, uptown, black, white, upper class, and um, lower class. And there was always a pageant to see who had the best looking costume. And um, things got interesting when people didn't win. People got a little ugly <laughs> when they didn't win. But anyway, it's her work for the Interstate Tadler that contributes a great deal to our understanding um, of the Harlem Renaissance. She described the Tadler as having a magazine format and covering society news, theater and entertainment stories, gossip, sports, and politics. She declared that the Tadler was one of her most exhilarating experiences as a journalist. As the managing editor, I had to make up dummies, handle hot type, read it upside down, and know the different typefaces and sizes for layouts. I used to take the copy to press and stay with it until it rolled off completed. So, uh, social snapshots, which appeared in the Tadler every Friday, um, was Jerry Major's primary social column and the premier social vehicle for the black elite. She often wrote about these intimate get-togethers, and you can perhaps read that. Uh, she's talking about a wedding. Um, in addition to her columns, social snapshots, and, and this is another one. Show you that. And she's always promoting this idea of blackness as being kind of liberation. I mean, these, these little girls are taking dance classes. They're not mopping the floors. Oh, yeah. So in addition, <laughs> in addition to her columns, social snapshots, and between puffs, Ms. Disman also wrote a column about New York society for the Pittsburgh Courier. She wrote, she had so many columns in so many places. It's kind of interesting. Um, between puffs by Lady Nicotine, was a gossip column written anonymously and published in the Interstate Tallery. It was in focus almost exclusively on entertainers. And of course, Lady Nicotine was actually Jerry. When preparing his first issue of Ebony, publisher John Johnson decided that he had to have Jerry Major as his society editor. Major had social connections throughout the country and it was these contacts that made her such a valuable um, addition to Johnson Publications. Well, John Johnson's first offer was refused. So after learning of the upcoming coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953, he made first class reservations for Jerry to attend as Ebony Society editor. Well, even Jerry Major could not turn down the future Queen of England. So she, she cried and cried and cried, but she left her job and she joined Ebony. Uh, she became an associate editor at Johnson Publications in 1953 and held that position until 1967 when she left to become the head of the Paris office. Um, but she missed Harlem so much that after a few years she went back. Um, her column, Jerry Major's Society World, appeared in Jet. Do you know Jet? Okay. Barbershop? Use a barbershop hair salon. You know Jet. 
Um, a weekly magazine published by Johnson Publications. It was popular with readers as it featured the marriages and anniversaries of well-educated, locally prominent African Americans. Uh, Jerry also covered the Washington social scene with debutantes, and she included news from well-known black elite vacation spots such as Sag Harbor, New York, and Oak Bluffs, Massachusetts. Historically, black colleges and universities also received special mention. Jerry has been resurrected by novelist Persia Wright, White Wright, Walker, sorry, who based her Harlem journalist sleuth character on Jerry, and she is a contemporary writer. Um, hopefully, her Laney Price mysteries will lead readers to discover Jerry's society world. Well, there is one columnist who eludes me. The most fascinating gossip column is the Interstate Tattler's Town Tattle. The columnist is clearly an insider as the columns contain personal information about upcoming vacations, extramarital affairs, and other secrets. Written under the pseudonym, and let me tell you how smart I felt when I figured this out. I tell on you, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but I still don't know who it is. It's like, it's killing me. Anyway, um, the hilariously informative column used first names, initials, and nicknames to refer to the guilty. Quote, Gladys, if you don't keep away from B, G is going to do a little convincing that he is her husband. Aren't you capable of finding some unexplored land that's all alone? Um, but one item alludes to the reality behind the facade of Harlem life. I tell on you, writes, one never knows, do they? All that glitters is not gold. Some of the smiling and well-fed patrons seen at Harlem's most popular dining room would be surprised if Madame of the establishment would stop issuing mills on the deferred payment plan. Anyway, suppose a, a significant portion of each column is dedicated to those who are cheating on their spouses. And here's as a quote. Husbands are very dangerous liabilities, especially someone else's. Black eyes rectify mistakes, especially in Yonkers. The person would know who that was. The, the, uh, the little known but influential Bessie Bearden is she certainly helped to shape the coverage of Harlem's elite. Although she was better known for her community activism, professional achievements, and being the mother of artist Romare Bearden, it is Bessie's work as a journalist that made her an esteemed chronicle of, Har of Harlem society. Born in Atlantic City, New Jersey in 1891, Bessie Bearden wrote a column entitled Tidbits, short columns entitled Tidbits on New York Society, New York Society, and What's Happening in and Around New York for the Chicago Defender. She married Robert Bearden, a sanitation inspector with the New York City Department of Health. They both attended college and were firmly entrenched in, Negro, in Harlem's middle class. Bearden exemplified the modern woman and was seen as being typical of Harlem socialites as she was married, employed, politically active, and socially conscious. Bearden became the first Negro woman to serve on the school board in New York City, a position she held until 1939. Uh, she was a founding member of the ne Negro Women's Democratic Association, and she also worked as a social worker. Um, her columns appeared weekly and had a leisurely optimistic tone. I think her column is like more typical of what you would expect from a gossip columnist. Uh, she described the spring and coming summer of 1927 as follows. From now on, the social world will receive lovely dances, parties, music halls, and until late into the spring season, after which many of the smart set will be leaving for the seashores, mountains, or abroad to, to seek quiet. There were no snarky references to infidelity or other wrongdoings. She often included details about her own social life as she hosted events and, and attended them with her very good friend, heiress Alelia Walker and Harold Jackman, of course. 
um, of particular note, this one of Holmes, of particular note is Bearden's moving article in the Chicago Defender on the funeral of James Walton Johnson, who was killed and his wife injured when their car was hit by a train, by a passing train on a fog, foggy, uh, rainy night in 1938. Despite the brevity of the funeral, it lasted only 30 minutes. Her account captured the emotion of the event. Johnson's funeral service was conducted by Reverend Frederick Cullen, Countess' father. Um, she emphasized the diversity of the funeral attendees while conveying the closeness that she, that she had personally with Johnson. She writes, they were there to see and hear, not to be seen, for they came in street, home, work, and kitchen clothes, a condition the deceased, more than anyone else, would have loved. Um, Bessie Bearden, died unex rather unexpectedly from pneumonia on September 16, 1943. The response to her passing was enormous. The New York Amsterdam News, the Pittsburgh Courier, and Philadelphia Tribune were among the numerous publications that covered her death and funeral. She was hailed as the Great Lady of Negro America by the Courier. Although her efforts have largely been forgotten, she merits attention for her work in journalism and for her dedication to political action. So in addition to her son, Romare, Be Bessie Bearden left behind a legacy of journalism and a commitment to her community. Her papers are part of the Schomburg Collection at the New York Public Library, and hopefully they will help to cement her place in the history of Harlem. Now, although most of the identified columnists were women, there was one distinctive man in the group, Edward Perry. Journalist and actor managed not to be just a member of the inner group, but an important chronicler of its events. He was a sought after reporter who wrote for almost all of the major Negro publications. But meeting renowned party planner Elsa Maxwell in Paris in 1929 changed his life. Impressed by Maxwell, he sought to imitate and surpass her by becoming a party planner. So he did become the most sought after party planner in Harlem and followed what he called the Maxwell method. A lengthy article in, on Perry and Ebony called him Harlem's Elsa Maxwell. Perry was a close friend to County Cullen and Harold Jackman. Um, he seemed to be present at every important social event and was able to document them. He was clearly a member of Harlem's gay inner circle and he was most likely one of Countess lovers. He played an important role um, at two of the most um, prominent funerals of the Harlem Renaissance for different reasons. At the funeral of Alelia Walker in, eight, in August 1931, Perry was chosen to read Langston Hughes's poem written in memory of Walker and entitled For Alelia. He also covered the funeral for the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, a key indication of his status was his role at the funeral of Claude McKay. Towards the end of his life, McKay had few friends in Harlem, and if you've read any of his correspondence, you know why. Um, he died in Chicago in 1948. Perry read one of McKay's poems at his funeral, which started three hours late because there was no casket for the body. Born in Jacksonville, Florida, Perry migrated to New York City in 1924, where he studied art at Pratt Institute and took classes with the famous Weinhold Rice. Uh, it was working as the secretary to actor Basil Rathbone that exposed Perry to the world of high society. Um, one of his columns in the Pittsburgh Courier uh, was entitled, Young Artist Gives Points on How to Dress. He identified what he deemed to be appropriate attire for young Negro women. Um, and he espoused a feminist message in that he uh, advocated that the Negro woman be free in her appearance and encouraged her to place more importance on herself than on her career and her home. He also, very thoughtfully, 
uh, encouraged Negro women to wear more flattering colors. And instead of following trends, wear, suits that, wear styles that suit their bodies. He was also adamant about the minimal use of cosmetics and took time to distinguish what were the appropriate colors for various skin tones. But it was the theater world that was Perry's um, special milieu. It should be noted that he helped to establish the practice that Negro journalists be giving free tickets to all Broadway productions, not just the shows that featured Negroes. Um, he also, uh, along with Orson Welles and Carlton Moss, helped John Hausman to stage Macbeth in Harlem in 1936 for the Federal Theater Project. The production became known as the Voodoo Macbeth because of its setting in Haiti. Um, Perry's view of the, ninth, of the 64th annual Hamilton Lodge Drag Ball in 1931 provides a tantalizing look at the intersection of sexual orientation, fashion, voyeurism, and class. And I thought you'd find this interest, an interesting um, difference from Jerry's. More than 7,000 people attended the 1931 ball. Attendance remained high even during the Depression. Perry's description is rich in detail, but his tone was respectful, but always opinionated. He suggested that at least for one night, those in attendance could freely express their sexual longings. The frolic, which was respectfully, he writes, the frolic, which was respectfully called a masquerade, is the annual occasion upon which members of one sex who wish to impersonate members of another sex may throw off their inhibitions and assume the roles of their desire. It is also the occasion for Harlem's social elite, Broadway's thrill seekers, and all pseudoscientists of the metropolitan area to gather and watch the spectacle. Perry gave a lengthy description of the winning garment and managed to interview some of the participants. He noted that the white participants produced columns of superior quality, no doubt to their ability to purchase finer details. And he, go, finer materials, he goes into great detail about each um, outfit. But the award for, mo for best costume was the most coveted of the evening. And Fights ensued upon the announcement of the winner of Best Costume. He wrote, several minor, fight, minor fights broke out among the few disappointed runner-ups. These slight altercations were broken up, however, by police and firemen before they reached the hair-pulling and wig-pulling stage. He alluded to sexual shenanigans that took place during and after the ball. He writes, compared to affairs of other years, Friday's drag maintained an almost respectable air until the pageant was finished. After that, though, the lid blew off, and the impersonators started making promiscuous passers at the spectators, often and, and often open and often encouraged flirtations were carried on. Perhaps Jerry Major's approach to covering the drag ball um, had a lasting impact. After she began working at Johnson Publications, scholar Thaddeus Russell noted that both Ebony and Jet gave regular and prominent, prominent and positive coverage of the drag balls in Chicago, New York, and Detroit. And through the early 1950s, regularly featured articles on homosexuality. The typical articles on the balls in the magazine pa passed no negative judgments and, of course, included detailed descriptions of the performance outfits. Ger Geraldine Hodges, Dismond Major, Bessie Bearden, and Edward Perry chronicled the social and political activities of the New Negro in their perspective, respective society columns, and in doing so, helped to define and sustain the representation of the new Negro. Their legacies in their, are in their journalism, and it is to them that we should look for further exploration of the intimate life of the new Negro. Thank you. <laughs>